if you grew up in rural North Carolina in the early 2000s like I did, you would know that two things are true. There's just about nothing to do at any given time, and everyone there is either way too nice or a complete asshole. There is no in-between. But I don't want to talk about the people of North Carolina today. I want to tell you all about something that happened to me and my brother around 2002. I was 8 years old, and my brother Darren was 10. Darren and I were really close back then, and spent a lot of time together. If we weren't playing Dreamcast or Xbox, we were outside resting on the trampoline or playing basketball. When none of that seemed to suffice, we would throw stones. Now, we wouldn't throw them at each other, but one of us would pick a target, most of the time a skinny tree out back or our mailbox, set a distance away, and see who could hit it first. With a gravel driveway and a dirt road right next to the house, there was no shortage of rocks. The thick woods behind our house also gave us ample amount of targets. As kids, this throwing stone game, which we aptly called see who can hit that thing we chose first, would keep us entertained for hours. It got to a point where we'd hit nearly every single tree on the mile-long wood line. It was starting to lose its charm. It was on one of those days that Darren proposed an idea. We should go in those woods. I bet there's millions of trees out there. We'd never run out of targets. I looked at him in disbelief, but also in curiosity. He was much more of a risk taker than I was, but in that moment I couldn't tell if he was being serious. Our moms had made it explicitly clear that we were to never go in those woods. Funny thing is, they never fed us silly stories about monsters or strangers, but rather stories of real life dangers. What if you fell and broke your leg and we couldn't hear you calling for us? What if you climbed a tree and were too scared to get down? It made perfect sense to me as to why we shouldn't go into the woods, but like I said, Darren was a risk taker. Dinner table was quiet that night. The sound of forks and knives scraping ceramic and ice cubes settling in our cup were the only thing keeping the impeding silence away. It was a rare occurrence, but it was never a good one. Whenever our moms were quiet like this, they were normally building up the courage to say something us kids didn't want to hear. For clarification's sake, my mom's names are Tracy and Sarah. Tracy spoke first, though she spoke softly. We saw y'all out by the woods today. Just talking. Not throwing things like you usually do. Sarah picked up after that. You two aren't thinking about going in those woods, are you? She was always more stern than my other mom, more strict on discipline as well. We told you numerous times not to go in there. You could get hurt or get lost, Darren cut her off. I know, Mom, you've told us a billion times. At that moment, I wanted nothing more than to sink into myself and disappear until the yelling match that was going to ensue was over with. Sarah's face turned beet red, and I was almost certain she was going to explode, but Tracy put a hand on her shoulder and simply said, Calm down, Sarah. Go back there and relax for a bit. I'll clean up and put them to bed. Tracy pointed down the hall to their bedroom before looking back at us and giving us a reassuring smile. With a deep breath, Sarah stood up and began walking to the bedroom. A very low, sorry, you two, escaped her as she went. Once she was gone, Tracy started gathering up the dishes and taking them over to the sink. Before you both go to bed, be sure to brush your teeth. You can stay up a little later tonight in your room if you're quiet, but only if you promise not to go in those woods. She turned back to us. The look on her face was dead serious. I mean it. It's dangerous out there. Sarah's right about that. She sighed. Look, I was a kid once too, and I know it seems like we're trying to ruin your fun, but I promise you we're just trying to keep you safe. A soft smile broke her more serious demeanor. I love y'all. Now, Go get some pajamas on and go to your room. Maybe 
grab a board game from the hall closet before you go. In unison, we said, we promise. Then left for the small bathroom to brush our teeth. Once our mouths were minty fresh, and we picked out Battleship and headed to our bedroom. Most kids our age, I'm sure, would have hated the idea of a shared bedroom, but Darren and I were only two years apart. We had much more in common than most brothers, it seemed. The only thing we couldn't agree on, and would argue about constantly, was who got which bunk. I preferred the bottom bunk because I was afraid of heights. But Darren wanted the bottom bunk because he would get up to pee in the middle of the night about 90% of the time. These arguments were usually ended by him saying, If I pissed myself on the top bunk, it'd soak through the mattress and drip all over you. Within seconds, I'd be throwing my blanket and pillow up there. That night, Darren got his wish of bottom bunk using that exact argument. After a few rounds of battleship, Sarah stopped by our room to apologize again about dinner and tell us good night. Tracy did the same not long after, turning out the lights as she left. Before I knew it, I was asleep. Sometime later, I was woken up by a bright flash of light. I thought at first it was lightning, because when I opened my eyes and looked around the room, it was pitch black. I sat in silence, waiting for another flash or a crash of thunder, but there wasn't one. I was confused, but decided it was best to just go back to sleep, so I rolled over. But then something else caught my attention. Something I recognized. A certain sound that at this time of night only meant trouble for Darren and me. I sat up quickly. Darren, what are you doing? He groaned. God damn it, Marcus. Just go back to sleep, man. I was working my way down to the bunk bed ladder as he spoke. I don't need your help with this. I'm just going to go and come right back. I was right in front of him now, able to see his face as my eyes had adjusted to the darkness of our bedroom. I knew exactly what he was planning to do. I grabbed his arm and said, Darren, this is stupid. Just go back to bed. We'll go out there tomorrow. Yanking his arm away, he said, No, I've been planning on doing this for about a week. I even snuck into Mom's room and took the batteries from their back massager for this flashlight. He sighed and rubbed his eyes, like an annoyed parent. <sighs> Look, man, when I brought this up to you today, it was to test you, to see if you're ready to do something like this with me. He looked at me hard, his deep brown irises looking almost as black as his pupils in the low light. But you're not. So I'm going alone, and I'm going to figure out what's out there. Within the next few seconds, he was out the window, running off into the woods the ray of light from the flashlight flailing around as he went. I watched that light continue on into the dense forest being frantically shown around before slowly becoming harder and harder to see. A million thoughts raced through my little prepubescent brain at the time. Was he going to be okay? Had I overreacted? Had I not done enough? Should I go tell my mom's? Should I go with him? The last one caught me off guard. At any other moment in life, that question wouldn't even have come up as a possibility. I wasn't like Darren. I didn't do stupid things like going into the woods when our moms told us not to, especially in the middle of the night. But maybe, I thought, maybe I could turn something stupid Darren had done into something smart for me. It made sense at the time, but looking back, making the decision to go out in the woods to look for Darren with no flashlight was the most idiotic thing I could have done. I should have gone to Sarah and Tracy, tell them what Darren had done. I'd never live it down, and he'd call me a tattletale for the rest of my life, sure, but he would have been safe. I could have fought him harder about going in the first place. I could have done so many things. But I chose to crawl out that window and run off to the woods. Just like Darren had. I remember it being 
far colder than I'd anticipated. It was mid-November and going out there in nothing more than my pajamas and shoes with no socks only made the idiotic decision to go even more idiotic. Darren hadn't grabbed his coat either. They'd been hanging by the door in the living room and it was far too risky to sneak out there and grab them. At the tree line now, I could barely see my house. Nearly every light was off except for a bathroom and the overhead light on the stove. I worried about not being able to find my way back, but... I rationalized that if I found Darren, he'd have the flashlight and we could go back together. The first step into the woods was the hardest one. The sound under my feet changed from dirt and sand to thick, crunchy leaves and moist sediment. The further I ventured in, the further away my house was. The quieter everything became. There was little to no sound from wildlife, no creaking of trees threatening to fall. Even my own footsteps seemed subdued. The small amount of moonlight peeking through the forest roof provided just barely enough light for me to see where I was going. I thought I was going in a straight line, but truthfully, that would be imp- Something caught my foot and I was sent forward so quickly I didn't have time to throw my arms out to catch myself. The unforgiving forest floor knocked the wind from my chest, and as I rolled over onto my back, looking up to the sky, or rather the treetops that towered over me, I thought for a second I was suffocating. It was the first time I'd ever experienced something like that, and so my childish mind went immediately to, I'm dying. Of course, I wasn't dying, and after some moments I was able to pull in enough air to gather myself to a point where I could stand. When I saw what had tripped me, though, all that breath left me again. It was Darren. He was lying on the ground, the flashlight beside him broken beyond repair, and his head facing away from me. And he wasn't moving. Even as a kid, I knew something was wrong. I knelt near him and rolled him over to face me. Darren was always lighter skinned than I was, but in this moment his skin had faded into a pallor that left him nearly unrecognizable. His lips were darker now, his body rigid and ice cold. The most horrifying part, though, were his eyes, or lack thereof. All around his eye sockets were cuts and slashes that left them void of anything that resembled an eyeball. It was like staring into two black holes. I slowly backed away, trying to hold a scream when I bumped into something equally as freezing as Darren was. It wasn't a tree, and it had quite some gift to it. Slowly, I turned, expecting the worst. And that's exactly what I got. Just a foot or so from me stood a boy, no older than Darren. He was white as a sheet. He looked dirty, like he'd been rolling in mud and his hands were covered in dried blood and dirt. He then lifted his hands to his face, covering his eyes before opening them up, revealing two eyeballs. He held them there like the pale man from Pan's Labyrinth, laughing and whooping loudly. He was happy about what he'd done and was gloating about it. I should have done something about it. I should have punched him, fought him like Darren and I used to sometimes when we were angry, but... I didn't. I just screamed at the top of my lungs and turned tail to my house, hoping that I was going the right way. I was still screaming when the house, now fully lit, came up into view. In the driveway, I saw two police cars parked next to my mom's van, and both of them, Tracy and Sarah, holding each other under the glow of our floodlights. I yelled out to them, causing them both to run towards me, meet me halfway. They pulled me close, not caring about the dirt or grime on me. They didn't even care that I'd pissed myself at some point during the whole ordeal with the little boy. They were just happy that I was safe. 
It felt good for a moment. Until Sarah said, Where's Darren, sweetie? Her voice had become hoarse from crying. I just looked at her, tears welling in my eyes now. I shook my head. They both knew what I meant. A lot of what happened after that is a blur. I remember my moms both crumbling into each other when they realized Darren wasn't coming out of those woods alive. It only got worse when the police found his body and began talking to me about what happened. I broke down the story over and over again, but they eventually chalked it up to an animal attack. Most likely something that was very hungry, given it attacked a human. This was due to the fact that no one else was found in those woods. They searched nearly five miles in, even going overhead with a helicopter, and found no sign of the boy I mentioned, or signs of anyone living out there. Eventually... The woods were closed off, and we moved out to a small apartment in a much more crowded area of town. They couldn't bear being close to those woods, or any woods, rather. I was never really punished. They knew, even if I had imagined the little boy, finding Darren like that was punishment enough. Years down the road, I'd get in therapy, eventually coming to terms with the loss, and almost convincing myself that my mind had created some horrifying scenario to understand what happened. Almost, but not quite. And that's because, as the years went on, I kept tabs on that old place. Once I was out of high school and staying on my own, I'd find myself driving by there to see if anyone had taken our place. Someone always had. I can't blame them. It was a beautiful house, secluded and private. Perfect for a new or developing family. That's always what it was. A mom and a dad, sometimes two moms, two dads, but no matter what, they always had kids. Some had one, some had three. I remember one time I saw five kids piling into an SUV. It was a family home through and through, but no one ever stayed long. On my many trips to see the house, I kept note of the fence that stood at the tree line. Year after year, it would fall further into disarray until eventually one panel fell completely. Eventually, numerous news stories a year about children going missing while out in those woods would pop up. Only days after it had been published, the house would be put back on the market for dirt cheap. Some new family with a shoestring budget would slide in, throwing their life savings into that house. They'd tell their little ones over and over again never to go in those woods, but kids never listen. After the ninth kid went missing, the house was torn down, forest blocked off completely, and anyone who thought about going in there was subject to misdemeanor trespassing charge. It was quite some time ago, though. Just this past year, on the anniversary of Darren's murder, I threw back a few cold ones. For some reason, it was hitting me much harder this time, and in my drunken stupor, I made the decision to drive back down to that now vacant lot. I drove slowly, and luckily for me, there was no one else on the road. (sighs) Pulling up to that lot was... something else. I could have sworn that if I focused enough, I could still see that house, still sitting there, waiting for some unsuspecting family to waddle their little ones in, ultimately to someone's demise. But it wasn't the house that did it, was it? No. It was those fucking woods. The six-foot-tall fence still stood strong. It was weathered, sure, but it was holding well. Not being able to help myself, I picked up a little rock, chose a specific plank on the fence, and sent the rock sailing. I managed to overshoot it, the rock striking some tree way back past the fence. I laughed at myself. (laughs) 
Why was I here? Just to dwell on something I can't fix? Tink. The sound caught me off guard. I looked all around me, called out if anyone was there, but I didn't see or hear anything. As I worked through what my story would be if the police showed, I heard it again, though this time it was much clearer. Tink. Turned my head just in time to see a small rock roll off the hood of my car and onto the ground. Pulling my phone out for the flashlight, I investigated and found the rock that made contact with my hood. It was covered in blood. Throwing it to the ground, I ran around to my trunk, pulled out a tire iron and flashlight. Before I knew it, I was scaling the wall and running full speed into those woods, looking for any signs of my attacker. Thirty minutes passed, and I took a moment to collect myself. Thirty minutes passed, and I took a moment to collect myself. The adrenaline had sobered me up some, so I had a moment of clarity. What the fuck was I doing out here? What did I expect to find? I let this grief and guilt get the best of me. Just as I was about to leave, a small stone came sailing toward me from the darkness ahead. I managed to duck out of the way and point my flashlight in that direction. The ray of light illuminated a figure. A man. He was white as a ghost. He wore jeans that were far too small for him and had blood dripping from his hands. He looked at me and smiled before putting his hands to his face, covering his eyes and revealing the eyes of an animal. It was the same kid. It was the kid who'd killed Darren. Rationale flew out the window and I gave chase, intent on doing to him what he did to Darren. Though he was fast, my adrenaline pushed me to speeds I didn't know I could reach, and when he was within reach, I swung the tire iron down, resulting in a disgusting wet crunch. I'd brought it down so hard I fell to the ground, giving him ample time to run off. I wanted to get up and chase him again, but I knew I'd never find him alone, so I did the only thing I knew to do. I left the woods, my body fighting every step as the adrenaline wore off, and I called the police, saying I saw someone roaming around the property while I was out. When they finally arrived, the sun was starting to come up. He explained in greater detail what happened, and while the police seemed to think I'd finally gone off the deep end, when I showed them the tire iron that was now stained with dry blood, they took things more seriously. A bloodhound was brought out, and the trail led to the man I'd seen. He'd bled out overnight, and much like Darren, his body was stiff and turning blue. They believed at first the man was clutching a weapon, but when they looked closer and brushed away some of the leaves, they saw it was actually a hatch. The police discovered a young woman and the bodies of a man and another woman along with numerous animal carcasses. The bodies were far beyond identification, but after taking the woman in for questioning, it was determined that they were brother and sister. The older man and woman were their parents. From what I pieced together from articles online and various news outlets on TV, it was estimated the man and woman had taken their kids down there in late 1999 for fear of Y2K. Once that came and went... The parents convinced the children the only way to stay safe was to live off the land. The articles say the family believed the food in the stores had been tainted with some form of radiation brought on by the fall of computers and electronics. It was quite the conspiracy theory to read, and it landed the young woman in an institution for treatment. She isn't suspected to last long, however, because she had developed Kuru a neurodegenerative disorder brought on by eating human brains. From what I understand, the food stashed in the bunker had run out, and the children had thinned the small animal population quite a bit. When their parents died, 
they turned to cannibalism. It's painful to think that Darren would have faced the same fate had I not been there. The forest was destroyed a short time later through many controlled fires, and the bunker was cleaned and filled with concrete, ensuring no one else would venture down there. Sarah and Tracy handled the news about as well as you'd imagine when I told them, and with both of them getting a little older, I think I'm going to move closer to them. Maybe even try and convince them to move in somewhere with me so we can all be further from that dreaded place. In the end, I think I learned something. When your parents tell you not to do something for fear of you being hurt, it's probably best to listen. I used to be a normal person. I just want to get that out clear first of all. Yeah, I had a few strange hobbies, but when this all started out, I was just like your average Joe. One of my strange hobbies was browsing the deep web. It was mostly out of curiosity, let me assure you, but I wasn't involved in anything shady and also made sure to take adequate precautions. One day, I was looking at random web pages when I stumbled upon a curious one. Hello there. Are you perhaps interested in buying other people's souls? I've been collecting people's souls for a very long time, and I have a bit extra. It was one of the most basic web pages that you could imagine, with only an address on where to send the Bitcoin to buy one. I laughed when I saw this. I had seen my share of scams on the deep web, but this one was new. I went to close the window before something popped up on my screen. Hello there. I see you're browsing my site. My heart nearly froze when I saw it was a chat box, but I was sure the security measures I'd taken were sufficient to prevent someone from tracking me or hacking into my computer. How did this pop-up appear out of nowhere, then? Relax. I just noticed that you were going to leave without buying anything. It seems you haven't been convinced that what I'm selling is real. Why not try a free sample? A simple... Yes and no dialogue box appeared. Now, I should have clicked on no, but in my curiosity, I clicked on yes. A bad decision in hindsight, but I wanted to know where this was going, and I was a bit too confident in my own ability to shield myself from danger lurking on the internet. It's rather hard to explain what possessing a soul is like. You probably think that a soul is immutable, or indestructible in other words. And you'd be right. In that moment, I could tell in my head that I held a single soul, but there was also a way for me to manifest it in the real world. It appeared as a tiny ball of light, no bigger than the smallest bone in your pinky. I reached out to touch it, and a flood of memories entered my head. The soul was of a woman named Alexandra Cortez. She had not had a very happy childhood and had escaped her home when she turned 16. A few bad decisions involving drugs and she had literally nothing left on her and was slowly dying. It was here that the memories became less clear. There was a strange shadow that I could see but nothing clearer than that. Mind you, Everything that I could see had been as clear as if I were the one seeing it, but this figure was covered in what I could only describe as a dark smog. She had sold her soul to this thing in exchange for money. The rest of her life was rather good, not fantastic by any means, but it was still decent and paradise compared to what she'd suffered earlier. It all ended one day when she was walking along a dark street corner and a man ambushed her. She died that night, though not before hours of torture at his hands. There was far more, of course. 
I had her entire life in my hands, but I only put down the important bits given her whole biography. You could take up several books. That wasn't all, though. I could hear her thoughts as I held her soul in my hand. She was pleading, begging me to let her go. Now you're probably wondering what the afterlife is like. I have to confess that I never found out, just that there was something beyond where souls could go to. After listening to her pleadings, I agreed to let her go. As much as I said earlier, I can't really explain how I let her go, just that I did. She vanished before me and the light also went away with her leaving my mind completely clear. I thought what had happened was just some sort of odd hallucination, or rather, I hoped that's what it was. I didn't want to believe there was some monster collecting souls around the internet. That was until four days later when I got an anonymous email linking back to that site. Hello there. I hope you enjoyed your free sample. Perhaps you'd like to purchase another. We're having a sale right now. The mail confirmed to me that it wasn't a fever dream, and after a moment's hesitation, I decided to make an actual purchase. I should have realized something was wrong the moment I saw the prices. They were dirt cheap, which made very little sense given what I'd learned later on. I got the souls of three more women, and they were quite similar in many ways. Much like with Alexandria, I couldn't see the entity they sold their souls to properly. The amounts of money they got for their soul was quite staggering. I had barely paid 0.00001% of that price. Again, that should have told me something was off about this whole thing, but I was rather oblivious to the fact then. What I was more focused on was that they had all died in similar ways, by being ambushed by a man. They never saw his face, though, but they would all died in agonizing ways. Letting their souls go free brought a certain peace to mind. Kind of like an animal rights activist who buys animals intended for slaughter and then releases them, I guess. Except, I was releasing these human souls not from death but from damnation. I highly doubted that whatever entity bought them in the first place was kind to them. I bought another one a few days afterward, and it was here that things took a dark turn. It was the soul of a man named Christopher. I don't want to share his full name here, but that hadn't even been what I had been concentrating on at the time. No. When I went through the memories of his life, I was sickened by what I saw. This man was a serial killer. Those four women I told you about earlier, he was the one who'd killed them. He had done it to over 17 more. The mere thought of it made me want to throw up. Again, I couldn't see the figure to whom he sold his soul to. He hadn't done it for money. No, he had been caught by the police and had exchanged his soul for getting out of jail. Some sort of legal loophole was there because the police didn't document a piece of evidence correctly and he was let go. And he killed again. And again, ten more victims before being caught and given the death penalty. Much like those before him, he begged to be released. But no sort of compassion emerged in my mind. I was sickened by what he had done and appalled that he'd suffered so little compared to his victims. In my rage, I took hold of his soul and wondered what I could do with it. I could now hear him pleading again in my mind, but I ignored that and lit the stove. And then I dropped a small ball of light onto the flame. Oh, he definitely felt that. He couldn't die, but he could feel the flames consume him. 
I could hear his screams, and though at first I was disgusted with myself, I learned to live with it. This man had no regrets or remorse for what he had done, aside from the fact that he was dead. It became a daily routine for me. I would try to find new ways to torture him. I would stick him in my freezer. I would stab his soul with a knife. I even thought about buying acid from somewhere to dip him in, but that would raise too many questions, so I gave up on it. I never really considered myself to be a vindictive person, but I think it was because I'd been so close to some of his victims and had felt all that they felt when they died that I did what I did. Once you've held someone's soul in your hand, you can't help but get a little attached. Eventually, I got tired of this after a few weeks and let him go, but in case you're worried, I assure you he suffered ten times worse than what he'd dealt out. I then bought another soul a couple of weeks later. This one belonged to a woman who had killed three of her own children. My heart was hardened from before, and I went about my way making sure she got what she deserved. It continued like that. Nearly every single soul that I bought was some sort of horrible criminal. I didn't get any innocence to release like I did earlier. And I was okay with that. I was no longer buying souls with the purpose of saving them from the clutches of a demon. I wanted the souls of sinners so that I could punish them. After a few times, it gave me a weird, giddy feeling in my stomach whenever I would sit down and think about what I would do to them. Soon, my apartment had over two dozen of them. I spent nearly every free waking hour tormenting them as much as I could. I'd pretty much given up on all my other hobbies and even hanging out with my friends or family. There's no easy way to describe it, but there's something really amazing about owning someone's soul once you get past how twisted it initially feels. To have so much power over someone else, it just feels incredible in a way. I can't put it into words. Not to mention there was little guilt involved now, since I knew the people I was lording over deserved everything they got. It was more addicting than anything I'd ever tried before. Eventually, I ran into a small roadblock, though. The prices for the souls increased. Exponentially, I should add. They were worth right about how much they should have been. I'd already released a good number and was quite frustrated that I couldn't get my hands on some more. I got an email a few days after that. Hey there, champ. Seems that you're a bit short on cash lately, but since you've been such a great customer, I was thinking that you could have a few of them for free. A few strings attached, of course. I just need you to do a few things for me. Consider it kind of a job. I barely even read the conditions as I agreed to it. That was how much I was hooked. Now, I have over a hundred souls. I spend all of my time dealing with them. My new boss, although I've never met him, is pretty great. I have a quota of how many cells I have to torture in a day, and so long as I do that, I keep getting new ones. Not only that, but I also get paid to do this. I've quit my job and torture these people full time now. Everything has been great, though. I have noticed a few changes when it comes to my body recently. There are two small bumps on the top of my head that just won't go away. I've been meaning to go to a doctor, but I haven't found the time. My skin has begun to turn a shade of gray, and I feel something growing out of my back. I can't really be bothered with all that. A new shipment of souls came from the website, and I need to get to work on them. I don't want my new boss to become angry, and anyway, to be honest, I just really enjoy doing this. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening tonight. Um, let me know in the comment section below what you thought about these two stories, especially my story. It was a fun one to write. I based the characters off of me and my older brother from when we were kids. I took the name Darren. Uh, I got that from my brother's name, Daryl. And of course, you know my name. So 
just kind of put two and two together there. <laughs> um, but it, 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 it was slightly true. My brother was never murdered or anything, but the whole premise of throwing rocks at things when we were bored, that was a big thing for us. We did that a lot. And the idea of throwing a rock into the woods and then having something throw it back at you kind of freaked me out as I was just kind of thinking about it. So I decided to put it into a story, and I was actually really happy with how it came out. Let me know what you think about it. Let me know what you think about the second story. If it was something you were up for or something you thought was kind of silly or whatever. Um, I know the deep web stories can be kind of hit or miss for some people, but I enjoyed I enjoyed it. Um, so just let me know. Also, let me know what you did as a kid when you were bored. I know I have a pretty large audience that's in my age range, 25 to 30, but I do also have a large majority that are in their 40s or 50s. So let me know what you did for fun as a kid. I'd be really interested to hear that. Thanks again, everyone, for listening. Have a wonderful night, day, or afternoon, wherever you are. And as always, sleep tight.